Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 230 of The Team House. I'm Jack Murphy here with David Park. And we're really happy tonight to have in studio our guest, Aaron Schwartzbaum, who is a Russia expert. We had him on about a year and a half ago, like really a week or two after the war kicked off to really do kind of a deep dive on the war in Ukraine. And I'm going to catch back up. we got a lot to talk about tonight. But uh, first. Uh, First, we want to say thanks to our first sponsor of the evening, ReMedical. Let's take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, ReMedical. We know how difficult it can be to get accurate disability rating and the proper benefits despite your best efforts and multiple doctor visits when it comes to the Veterans Administration. Connecting new or worsening disabilities to your service just adds to the frustration because they all act like the money is coming out of their pocket for some reason. This is ReMedical's wheelhouse. The documentation process they've designed to help veterans is unmatched and the experience of the doctors in their network is invaluable. Now, every case is different, and ReMedical can't guarantee what the VA is going to decide, but 95% of their clients reported receiving a disability rating of 70 or higher. ReMedical's nationwide network of disability specialists and medical professionals are ready to help veterans across all 50 states and those working or living overseas. So if you need an evaluation of your disability rating and accurate medical uh, evidence to support your VA claim, turn to the team at ReMedical. Head over to ReMedical, that's R-E-E medical.com slash the team house. That's R-E-E medical.com slash the team house for more info. Don't fight that battle by yourself, guys. Like, it's a complicated system. Get professionals on your side. Reach out to ReMedical. So, Aaron, uh, can you give us like a, a brief recap, recap on, you know, your background and uh, where where you're coming from? I know we talked about it probably in depth on the last one. Yeah, the origin story, right? Yeah, just for, for people who haven't heard it yet. Well, first of all, thanks for having me back. Good to be here. Um, so, yeah, by background, I'm a Russia analyst, but I've also bounced around the political risk and startup space, uh, federal facing for the last couple of years. So kind of a tech risk and subject matter regional hat I wear. So currently, and just want to emphasize speaking for myself tonight, so my Russia-Eurasia affiliation is with the Foreign Policy Research Institute, FPRI, which is a nonpartisan think tank in Philadelphia, where I live. It's a great city, folks. Um, that's the one. Um, I'm working with a startup called Altana, actually here in Brooklyn, that does supply chain analysis, applying uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to global trade, some really cool analytics there. And I'm also working on a DOD grant project about great power influence and seeking to measure and quantify and visualize uh, how the US, China, and Russia exert influence globally. So a lot of hats, um, but I think the this Russia stuff is the technical term is my, my first love. So yeah, it's been a pretty wild year and a half. Mm-hmm. Crazy to think how much has happened since last I was on. There's a lot of grounds to cover today, I think. Do you have any uh, <laughs> thoughts about where you'd like to start that conversation? Oh. I mean, we can start big picture and go small picture, or uh, that's probably the the right way to to go about this. So, since the invasion kicked off, I mean, I think we talked in the last episode a lot about the drivers for the conflict and sort of where it stood at the time. Um, big picture, how have you seen things unfold over the last year and a half? Yeah, so a couple of, I guess you could say, like the big themes we've seen. So, I mean, for one, the tenacity of the Ukrainian people. We, we saw that at the very get-go. That was true true the first time we did this, and that's true now, and that hasn't really flagged or, or wavered over this whole thing. I think, uh, I guess last time we talked, uh, the Russian military forces were probably, what, a weekend, still parked fairly close to Kiev in the suburbs. Um, so we've seen the war swing back towards Ukraine's favor largely. It's, I don't want to say stalemated, right? We don't want to use uh, too loaded terminology here, but kind of taken on more stable contours, I guess. Mm-hmm. Less maneuver, more of a slog of late. And I think we can talk a lot more a lot more the, about the that. The battlefield has mature, matured a lot, yeah. Yeah, so there's that. Um, I think those are the two big trends. I think the other other thing worth mentioning is some of the lessons that we've kind of learned time and time again about the nature of warfare and 
the extent to which we're seeing some new technology and new developments. But what is this the line about how like the character of war changes, the nature of war doesn't, and seeing like the what proliferation of drones and new stealth cruise missiles being tested from Western countries, X Y Z, but ultimately there's a lot of math problems that you know relate to fighting a large interstate war and i think okay another lesson big takeaway is how nasty near peer competition is and there's just mm. there's no ifs ands or buts about it it's it's bloody and it's brutal and it's horrible and that's just that's just the nature of it there's no it's not a desert storm thing it's not how that right. works when you're fighting an opponent who's at your kind of weight class Right. This is more of a, a war of attrition uh, where there are front lines. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Profoundly. I mean, there was the New York Times did a report. I want to say it was around Bakhmut talking to uh, a medic, a Ukrainian medic who just I mean, it still sticks with me. Just the the real like thousand yard stare in his eyes. He wasn't even on the front, but I mean, was I mean, almost like hollow as a person from like the stuff he had seen. Right. And, right. Basically said, like, I, I, I don't know any if any of you would understand. Like, I, it's not even worth sharing what I've seen. I just, you won't get it. And, yeah, I, it's still, like, that face is, like, stuck with me. Hope he's doing okay. Um, yeah, that's, that, was a, that was a tough one to watch. And I think it was you that pointed out to me that, you know, one of the big lessons that come out of all of this is that for all of our talk about cyber warfare and stealth technology and, and you know, on the American side, we talk about all these things that are over the horizon, directed energy weapons and all this sort of far flung, almost Buck Rogers sounding technologies. Um, here we are in a mat modern battle space, but it still comes down to at some point you got to go and clear the trench line. You need to clear through the breach. You need to send soldiers out there lobbing hand grenades into the trench. Yeah, there was Russia's push uh, in the east when that started. So after uh, Russian military forces withdrew from kind of central north Ukraine, from around Kiev, uh, Sumy, that area, and then concentrated on Donbass. Um, in their offensive, um, there was an episode where they lost, apparently, and it's hard to know the specific numbers here, um, about like maybe 500 people, multiple units of uh, like uh, materiel and tanks trying to cross a river. Yes, yeah, yeah. Trying to cross a river is hard. That is- With that, armored vehicles. With yeah. armored, yeah, that's just tough. It doesn't matter if there's cyber or what, it's just like that has remains true of warfare. Yeah, you can tell like a Roman general that to be like, yeah, like that's that's hard to get across the river opposed. Right? Yeah, when, like, when the Germans tried to push into Russia, they encountered all of this. So yeah, not, not new to anyone. That's uh, kind of like a yeah, reminder of some of the kind of the rules, the rules and laws that govern how this sort of thing tends to tends to happen. So, I mean, if I if I'm remembering quickly uh, correctly, and so much stuff has happened, but I mean, yeah, they successfully defended Kiev. The assault, the offensive from Belarus is pretty much you know done with. Um, but then we saw, you know, I guess at the halfway point, we saw a very successful Ukrainian offensive to recapture some of these areas and these like stunning images of Ukrainians rolling into these little villages and like old ladies coming out and hugging them and giving them oranges. Yeah. I, I mean, did, did that surprise you how effective they were at that time? I think that caught everybody by surprise. And I think it's it's interesting to see how that set expectations right. for yes, yeah. what's happening now uh, mm -hmm. down south of Parisia around what they talk about Tokamak. We can talk about some of the, mm -hmm. the geography and, and the counteroffensive now. But yeah, what was happening at the time was uh, Ukraine pushing on Kherson, which was the only major city to fall to Russian military forces. And it was, in a certain respect, kind of similar to what we're seeing uh, now in southern Ukraine, where it became kind of like a bloody, protracted slog through defensive line after defensive line, and albeit not as well dug in as the Russians are uh, in the places they're defending mm -hmm. now. Um, and that wound up being a successful offensive, but um, actually a bit of sleight of hand on the part of Ukrainians who really broadcast, and I think in international media too, like this is the thrust where we're really aiming for and actually know the secretly on the side gathering forces up north to move um, clear out the rest of Kharkiv Oblast. Uh, so up north and yet yeah, had a tremendous success uh, pushing back the Russians there. And I mean, that's, I think, really the example of, of maneuver warfare mm -hmm. kind of in the quintessential form, um, just moving around strong points. And I mean, 
you have to think there was some older gentleman in the U.S. somewhere who helped build the Humvee who must have been delighted watching them <laughs> zooming around the flat plains of Eastern Europe as they were, you know, designed. And, like, that's what they were built for, and they were good at it. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, that's given way to, as we'll get into, kind of a, a different kind of combat here. But, yeah, that was a, a real bloody nose for Russia. And it kind of shocked the world that Ukraine was able to right. pull that off. Right, right. I, I want to ask you real quick, in retrospect, you know, you talk about a bloody nose. In retrospect, like, there was a video of Jack and I and I think Andy Milburn all prior to the war saying, we There's think it was no way happen. this will happen. It's not going to happen, right? We were wrong. Um, a lot of people were wrong. We were wrong. I was wrong. Yeah. Um, then I think for most people in the United States, for most analysts, for most, you know, people interested in military stuff, they thought the Russian army would like, it, it would, you know, three days, five days, yeah. it'll, mm -hmm. it'll be done. And we were wrong. Um, through the course of this war, what are some other things aside from those two big ones? Have you seen people kind of go out there on the, not on the limb, whether it's popular, you know, a, a popular theory or not, where have you seen people just really fall short looking in retrospect in their assessment of what was happening, whether with Ukraine or Russia or anything else like that? I think one of the, we can talk about the larger kind of uh, trends we've seen with the war. Uh, I call it the boom bust cycle. And it describes a lot of the coverage of Russia domestic politics too, where coverage of the war tends to vacillate. It's never, hey, this is like a brutal near peer slog. It's extremely bloody and Ukraine is slowly advancing. That'd be a pretty nuanced, I think, fair take. It's either um, Ukraine is about to collapse, their forces are falling apart, or, you know, hey, Ukraine is gathered for this counteroffensive and there's absolutely nothing Russia could do. Right. A mm -hmm. nuclear armed state. Like, there's nothing Russia could do. This is the end. And it's like, that's, it's never really either of those extremes. And it still is the tone of coverage of like, Ukrainians are demoralized. It's like, well, no, they're like still advancing in the South. Like, they're, they're making progress. And there's other reports that they're actually feel pretty good to be making progress despite the heavy costs thereof. So, yeah, I think that's one of the things to be on the lookout for, where it's, it's these complete swings. So after the Kharkiv offensive, um, oh, like Ukraine, they've got it in the bag now. And then Russia pushed into Bakhmut, this absolutely bloodbath, urban slog fest. And oh, no, Russia, Ukraine's broken out. They got pushed out of Bakhmut. And then they gathered for the counteroffensive. Oh, now Ukraine's going to win. And it's like, no. So it, it keeps doing that again and again. And it's a good habit to uh, uh, kind of be aware of that pattern in coverage because the truth uh, remains somewhere in the middle. There's the, the classic line about Russia, what never, never is as uh, strong as you fear, never as weak as you hope. <laughs> um, and I think that is true, A, for Russia now. But I think, yeah, good thing to keep in mind about the coverage. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, you're right. That it, it's often portrayed as being hopeless for one side or the other. One other big trend I just want to drill down on. I had hopes to mention it and then forgotten. Now re remembered um, making peace with the fog of war. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like with a lot of military coverage, I don't know if this is unique to Ukraine, but like the over ostentification where like we can know everything happening yeah. exactly like the motivations, what's going on in each village and each mile of dirt. And like we can't and making peace with yet yeah, not really knowing exactly what may be happening at any given moment. And that's you know, easy to spit out like hot takes like this is what happened here. And we, especially with the counteroffensive now, we. We don't really know like a super granular level. There are people who do. They're not going to tell us what's <laughs> actually happening. Um, but yeah, it's 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 acknowledging that there there's a lot happening that we just we just fundamentally don't know. Yeah, no, you're 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 right. And I mean, I was thinking that this week, and we'll talk about it more. But with Pergosian, I mean, right away, everyone's like, "This is how it happens." Like, hey, you don't know that. Calm yeah. down. <laughs> you know, t take a step back. Um, no, but no, that's, that's, that's true. That's a very, that's a reoccurring theme throughout the conflict. And, you know, I think modern technology has kind of brainwashed us. We, we like self delude ourselves that we know more than we actually do. Yeah. Uh, I need technology for that. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of these, um, big battles, Kursan, Bakhmut, uh, Mariupol, um, you want to talk to us a little bit about the geography of Ukraine, and there's a lot, always a lot of talk about is this, you know, the cities are often the centers of gravity. 
are they strategic? Are they not strategic? Should they should the Ukrainians be fighting, um, you know, pulling the resources into this conflict or not? I mean, what what is the significance of these various um, centers of gravity in the conflict? Yeah, so I think we can talk about maybe more helpful to talk about the front lines now. We can talk about Kherson and Mariupol. I think one of the things when we're talking about strategic, it's important to talk about strategic how. Right. Because there can be strategically importance. Let's talk about the city in the south. Tokmak is not a large city, more of a town, really. That's just an importance transit hub. So, like, mm-hmm. that's one way of measuring uh, strategic importance. Um, from the other from the other hand, um, a city like Bakhmut, yeah, there's some rail junctions that's, like, importance-ish, but there's symbolic importance. There's political importance. And, and not to get too, like, Klaus Witsian here, but, like, people say, oh, there's the politics side of the north, and that's just all one big spectrum. So, like, Ukraine choosing to fight for Bakhmut wasn't a lot of the experts in the field, and there's a lot of people who know this stuff way better than I do, um, but would would say it wasn't military militarily necessary to defend that particular city, but politically it became kind of this point of resistance. They shall not pass. Right. They're done style. Like, we will stop them here. And as it were, Russia kind of exhausted itself by going after that. Russia, too, like, no, like, we will take this place that was not strictly necessary. Right, to take. So right. When they did, they ended up taking like a ghost town, just a hollowed out skeleton of what it was. Ghost town is maybe even generous. I mean, it kind of flattens the the whole the whole place. So it's not really much of a place <laughs> anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, as far as the, the geography. So um, at the beginning of the war, last time we last time we spoke, uh, it was around Kiev. This was like a attempted uh, decapitation. They were going to try to encircle Ukraine's capital, force political concessions, bing, bang, boom, done. Three days, have a big parade through the city and leave. And I think that's one of the things we, we learned maybe around the time we were talking or maybe soon after that a lot of the Russians who rolled in up north had their like parade gear with them. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that. In, yeah, like in their tanks. And I was listening to uh, a podcast actually by a colleague at FPRI who explains they like for like tankers, there's no extra space in there. I haven't served. So I wouldn't know that offhand, but like to bring parade equipment that takes up, these are cramped right. places. And yeah, these, they just tried this thunder run into Kiev and got completely shredded to, to bits and didn't work. Um, so we can talk about that geography, the geography that matters, I think particularly. So two pieces, two focuses here. So there's the land bridge. So if you think of Ukraine, um, Russia is now in control of this strip of land that connects Russia proper to occupied Crimea. And Russia built a bridge over the Kerch Strait, which connects the mainland to Crimea. They did that, but that's one pretty key vulnerability, Mm -hmm. right? If there's one bridge, that one bridge can be attacked and destroyed, as Ukraine has attempted. And some success can knock the bridge out of action. So the land bridge it's, it's land. You can drive can drive over it. So that's really the focal point. Ukraine's haul counteroffensive now is really predicated on severing the land bridge. And we can talk about like what severing means. Um, doesn't have to take all the territory to effectively sever the land bridge. That's one. Part two is Donbass, so eastern Ukraine. So before the war, these people's republics, which were nominally controlled by Russia with some local players who had their own agenda too, um, controlled a chunk of these two oblasts, these two regions, the equivalent of a state, um, large chunks of it. But Russia's stated aim at the beginning of the war, before Kherson and Zaporizhia, um, was to seize its the, the entirety of Donetsk and Luhansk. Russia has most of Luhansk now, but Donetsk uh, is, there's a large chunk of the oblast that Ukraine has held and has been really strongly fortified since 2014. And there's places where the front lines basically haven't changed since mm-hmm. since the uh, the seizure of Crimea, but that have just been so dug in and fortified. Avdivka is a city that comes to mind as, as one example, um, where Russia's strategic aim ultimately is to, to seize this territory. Hasn't been able to yet and is on the defensive right now. So unclear whether Russia has the ability to generate forces to, to achieve another offensive. So the the current offensive, do we want to talk about a little bit about the run up to it? And the because there, there, there was an extended period of arming and supplying Ukraine for this offensive. 
uh, bringing over the Bradleys and everything else. I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about the run-up to the offensive before we get into it? Yeah, so the story here is Ukraine kind of playing defensive in the East over time, all the while, in some cases, trading, trading space and land for time to kind of wind up its fist to basically generate more forces. And this was one of the things we saw early in the war, where Ukraine underwent national mobilization at the start of the war. Russia didn't. Russia did around. You know, as, as we as I think back on this, we came up with a list of like key events that right. that happened. And I keep thinking of more of them as we have this conversation. Yeah, Russia declaring partial mobilization in 2022. That was a pretty watershed event that has um, led Putin, I think, scared is not the right word, but certainly put him off of declaring more formal mobilization. Because of the internal strife. But yeah, um, Ukraine basically built up a lot of new forces uh, to try to launch this counterattack and sever Russia's land bridge. So make this Kerch Strait bridge the only place that Russia could resupply Crimea. Ostensibly go after Crimea too. I don't know if Ukrainian leaders themselves actually think that's going to happen or should happen, but they certainly talk about it. They want to demonstrate a will to uh, be able to attack everywhere and keep Russian military forces off balance. And we saw the Ukrainians kind of like probing the wire for quite a, quite a bit in the run up to this. And then there's the whole incursion into Belgorod by some sort of a proxy force. Yeah. So that was uh, one of these like weird <laughs> episodes where these are Russian nationalists who you would think would also have imperial views towards right towards Ukraine. Interesting. But yeah, they launched this incursion into Russia proper and took over a couple of towns for a while. And they're like a little fascist, ostensibly. A little fash, just a little, just, just a pinch? A, a, bit, a bit of fash as a, <laughs> as a treat. Um, yeah, but uh, they, yeah, kind of haven't been heard from <laughs> since. So I don't know what happened. I think the Western leaders, I think maybe fairly kind of slap on their wrist, hey, like don't associate with those people, but they're effective. And it's the same reason Ukraine in 2014 has relied on this Azov battalion. We can talk about them like they're they're willing to fight. And Azov, as it were, has become more professionalized and isn't really the same organization it was with the same problematic insignia. <laughs> it still has some of that, too. Um, yeah, no, we should we should get into that a little bit. Um, but then over uh, the summer, we saw the, the offensive start to kick off in earnest. Um, I mean, there are high hopes for that. I mean, we had conversations with it on, on this show with uh, with Andy and some other folks. Um, how, how has it kind of played out from your perspective? Do we got to do this? Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Aaron. Uh, go ahead, Dave. Um, which one did you want to do? You go go okay. ahead and jump on this. Yeah. January marked the third time a power station in North Carolina was damaged by gunfire recently. Authorities are saying the attack raises a new level of threat. Authorities are now checking our grid for vulnerabilities. They've ident identified nine key substations. Uh, if these substations are attacked, power could be knocked out from coast to coast for up to 18 months. Imagine a blackout lasting not days, but weeks or months, uh, but weeks or months. Your life would be frozen in time right at the moment the power fails. Lights all over the world would go out, throwing people into darkness. That's why having your own solar power is more important than ever. With, pa with the Patriot Power Generator, you get a solar generator that doesn't install into your house because it's portable. You can take it with you, even use it inside. But it's powerful enough, it's powerful enough for your phones, medical devices, and even your fridge. Right now, you can go to 4 Patriots. That's number four, patriots.com, and use code TEAMHOUSE to get 10% off your first purchase on anything in the store, including the Patriot Power Generator. You'll also get their famous guarantee for an entire year after your order, plus free shipping on orders over $97, and a portion of every sale is donated to charities who support our veterans and their families. Just go to four, the number four patriots.com and use code TEAMHOUSE to get 10% off. That's the number four patriots.com, TEAMHOUSE, to get yours today. 
And I want to tell you guys about the AARP Veteran Report. It's a free twice monthly email newsletter that salutes military service and provides a mixture of inspirational human stories and practical information for vets. You can subscribe to the AARP Veteran Report by going to aarp.org slash vet report. It's free. The newsletter goes to your inbox on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month. Toby is the senior editor and Justin is one of the writers. He's got a great piece about Badger 6 in this issue. It's unique in that it combines really badass stories about incredible warriors, but it will also give you articles about saving money through discounts and benefits, plus stuff about healthcare and work. Uh, we really like the style. It's patriotic, but not rah-rah. It respects military service in a very positive way, but it's real and the writing is high quality. There's nothing else out there quite like it. There are a couple regular features that are cool. My Hero, about a veteran uh, someone really admires. Uh, and also Then and Now, which is a cool story about veterans back in the day and what they're doing today. Uh, it's got positive upbeat, It's got a positive, upbeat vibe, and there's no politics in it. So, yes, it's free. You won't get spammed. It's well curated, a nice balance of light stuff and some items that are serious. It's obvious a lot of thought has gone into what veterans really need. Obviously, Toby is a veteran himself, and lots of the newsletter writers are as well. AARP is a great organization. It's kind of a secret, uh, kind of a secret, but the discounts you get for being a member pretty much pay for the membership on day one. And it really caters to anyone from their 40s onwards. It maybe used to have this image of being uh, for senior citizens, but that's just not the case nowadays. What is membership a year? It can be, I think, $9, but there's a big discount for veterans. I believe it's 43%. So go to aarp.org slash vet report and subscribe to the AARP Veteran Report. It's very easy, costs nothing, and you'll get something really worthwhile out of it. So thank you guys for supporting our sponsors. And that first ad, I'm just imagining that substation situation with like no social media for like four months and kind of blissful, but not for the economy, not for the rest of life. Right, that specific right, right. piece of it, yeah. Right. So um, when the offensive did kick off, um, what was your perception of how it played out? Uh, it didn't work as planned. Mm. And that's, I feel like, speaking of the boom bust cycle, that like, oh, this is. Ukraine is doomed. Yeah. This is the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Western military equipment doesn't work as advertised. The the Leopard 2 German main battle tank turns out can be destroyed, which is like, yeah, like it's a tank. If you blow up the <laughs> tank, it will blow up. Like that's but I think what became clear is that um Western leadership had been and Ukrainian leadership had just been counting that it would just break on straight through this very well-prepared defensive line in a similar fashion to what happened in Kharkiv up north. But what was the case is that really with the geography of Ukraine and one of these like fundamental like laws of gravity of war, like geography is king, it matters. And uh, to the, I guess we'll say to the west of where this is happening, there's the Dnieper River, which was another critical incident, the explosion of the Kachovka Dam. Yep, yep. Um, likely by Russia, we think. We can talk about that later. Um, but that kind of makes a river crossing very, very difficult, or at least a large-scale river crossing. Um, Russia kind of has this front running up the rest of Ukraine, so it was pretty clear where Ukraine would have to launch its counteroffensive. So mm -hmm. Russia was dug in, prepared, like really dug in. There's kind of the the parallel you can see with like the German trenches in World War One, where they were like, there's nothing nice about trench warfare, but compared to the uh, Allied trenches at the time, were like considerably nicer and like prepared for the long haul. And some of these Russian trenches you see are like they're they're fancy as far as trenches right, right. as far as trenches go. So, it became clear that these armored assaults into minefields were just not working. Now, I've heard good things about the survivability of this Western hardware. It's like the Bradley would get blown to bits, but I mean people would still get hurt or killed, but like there would be a higher survival rate than would be expected with like a Soviet BMP, other infantry mm -hmm. fighting vehicle. Um, but yeah, it wasn't leading to success. And so what appears to have happened is uh, Ukraine's military pivoted strategy a little bit and now uses a lot of these armored vehicles to uh, bring troops closer to the front and then very, very piecemeal, bite by bite, the nail clipper, salami tactics approach trench by trench. It's bloody, but it's on balance saving lives. They're trying to preserve their forces. And it's had some success. Now, uh, there's a town that's been in the news these last uh, 
last two weeks, maybe three weeks, Robotine um, has been like the center of fighting. And people say, oh, it's this Ukraine's been fighting two months to take this tiny little town, it wasn't a major population center. But on the other hand, Russia fought really, really hard to keep it. So clearly that's Russia signaling the importance of, of this town. Kind of a fun language fact, I'm a giant language nerd, so I wanted to bring this up. There's another town north of Robotine called Neskuchne in Ukrainian, which literally means not boring. And there was <laughs> like a massive fight for that town too, which is, I think, Actually named, if you will. So yeah, the the counteroffensive have been a, has been a slog. Um, there's been a lot of coverage. I think this week, a lot of the negative Western coverage. Mm-hmm. Oh, like it's hard, it's bloody, it's brutal. Um, but Ukraine is continuing to advance, and you don't have to take territory to command territory. Every bit Ukraine advances, it can bring its artillery further and further, kind of down towards the coast, and then shell and attack more infrastructure, and that makes it harder and harder for Russian military forces to do their job of defending. The the last offensive, it seems like they're sweeping right through these villages. This time they're creeping forward. I think I was reading today, sometimes they're taking 500 meters a day, sometimes they're taking a kilometer. Um, but there's also some give and take with the Russians there. And and to, to point out the the goal of the offensive, you were talking about the land bridge. And so their, their goal, correct me if I'm wrong, is to punch through Zaporizhia and sever that land bridge. Zaporizhia is the name of the oblast. Yeah, so there's there's two critical places that you really need to pay attention to. There's also Mariupol. You know, some people talk about Ukraine breaking through and making a run at the sea, which would be a spectacular victory. But right. Tokmak is a town that's kind of south of, maybe not directly south, probably more southwest, southwest of this Robotinia. And folks at home, you can look at a map. It will make this make a lot more sense. I can talk with my hands like a fighter pilot here like oh they're going this way and but um no so uh, Tokmak is a major like rail and road junction on the land bridge right there's it's a land bridge it's land but there's a couple of main roads main so if they can sever that artery that's important and then Melitopol would probably be the largest intact city that uh Russia continues to hold in Ukraine so that would be a pretty symbolic victory to take that back the other piece to keep an eye on so we have the Dnieper River mm-hmm. running um, to the west of Crimea and down into the Black Sea uh, through Kherson. And they have gotten to the other side in a few cases, haven't they? Yeah, so there's been some probing special forces action. I'm sure you'll hear some great stories after the war from people who were part of that. Um, there's this kind of lingering possibility that very difficult for Ukraine to get across the river because the main bridge is out and the destruction of the dam kind of turned this into a flat, marshy plain that's just like... You, a lot of pontoons you need. It's very muddy. You can't really get across that easily. But it's the least defended part of Russia's front, the hardest to dig into. So there's a kind of ever lingering possibility that Ukraine could somehow get across. But regardless of whether a mass attack is possible, it's certainly been able to provide pressure. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, one of the one of the kind of the pieces of pieces of like fundamental military laws, if you defend everything you defend nothing like right because russia can or sorry because ukraine can poke and probe russia has to keep some amount of forces there so it's but, it, but that works in in reverse too right that, that wherever russia decides to focus their forces or I'm, I'm sorry wherever ukraine decides to focus their forces russia can just kind of roll in a you know sort of like a stress ball in a way which which leads me to the question and 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 how how do we see an end to this conflict when when everything is right when when it's very hard to create such a decisive victory you, nobody you, unless they march into Kiev or into Moscow like how does how is the victory won where Ukraine maintains its stability as a country uh Russia you know gets out you, you know that that idea. So yeah, how do wars end? So I actually did an episode about this on the podcast I do for FPRI, Bear Market Brief, had a conflict resolution specialist come by and she described this condition called a mutually hurting stalemate, where both sides have kind of become cognizant of the fact that they can't achieve further gains and they're kind of just trading trading yeah, blows. The frozen to, conflict. To know, yeah. Well, no, but not a frozen conflict, like an active conflict where they're just 
just hurting each other. But they're not making gains with with no gains at all. And I, that's the one of the things that um, one of my like pet peeves about coverage coverage of the war, not coverage, some of the arguments made about the war, like why don't they just talk? Why don't they just make peace? Like peace is good. I hope the conflict ends. This is a bloodbath. It's terrible for all, for all concerns. But like, wars don't end because peace is good. Wars right. end because of uh, the status quo on the ground. One side has completely won, or both sides are tired out and don't think they can go any further, and they declare an armistice. So I still think the most likely scenario here is probably some kind of stalemate. I don't know where that's going to be, right? You could have a stalemate where Ukraine is threatening Crimea again and has made a breakthrough. You could have a stalemate along the line as it exists now seems less likely Russia is going to generate enough forces to launch an attack. Although Russia, speaking of like Russia being a stress ball, um, has up north in this uh, near, not near Kharkiv, the city, but near Kharkiv Oblast has been trying to attack, we think, to make Ukraine defend that territory and take away forces from the offensive. So this whole theory, yeah, if you're defending everything, you're defending nothing. Right. Ukraine hasn't really taken the bait and has evacuated people from these places. It has liberated, I think, understanding we can actually not give back this land, but let Russia take it because it's more important for prioritizing right, right. the counteroffensive right. right now. Um, but yeah, how does it end? There'll be a time where yet yeah, neither side's really able to to make to make further gains. And I think that leads to discussion. But there's there's not really a military situation that would suggest that that's likely right now because Ukraine is advancing. They force has utility right um there's domestic politics of it you know, Zelensky is dead in the water if he gives up ukrainian territory and there's i think the polling has shown and i was checking today uh just to, to be up to date so i think it's something where like 30 percent of ukrainians which is still a minority say like oh we're like we'd really like peace like we're willing to make concessions but then you ask Ukrainians about, like, here are the concessions Ukraine could offer, and they're just like, nope, 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 right. nope. Um, so <laughs> peace is nice, but if you ask about, like, the mechanics of it, that's the one. Putin probably could turn on the dime and say, hey, we, we're ending the war, and we're just taking the territory we had when the war began, and Crimea, we're leaving for another day. We did it. Victory. And, like, he controls the information environment, so, like, he probably pull that off decently right but do you do you think at this point though do you think that ukraine because i mean let's face it like uh putin took crimea in like 2014 and we didn't really do shit about it like the u.s government like it was it's kind of a non-issue for us right um now it's now this invasion is an issue but but also now it's sort of it's political talk so if Putin were to pull out and just say, look, no harm, from no foul. We still got Crimea. I don't think Ukraine's going to stand for that. And I don't think that U.S. or Europe will allow that to stand. Or do you think well, so? It will? depends. So, like, will Ukraine likely ever say, like, Crimea is Russia now? Like, I doubt that. Is there a situation where the war has kind of not frozen? They're still fighting, but like stalemated. Right. And it's this is there's an armistice or like this is the status quo. Like Russia gets to have right. X, Y and Z. Crimea, we, we will revisit in 10 years and we're not admitting anything, but we're not going to fight over it now. Like that's a possibility. But the other problem is that we can get into some of the international relations. Absolutely. Yeah. Theory here. Hell yeah. Um, so th- there's the credibility issue that Russia, this war seems and one of the lessons we've learned is that seems to really have been planned in Putin's head mm-hmm. where there was not, I don't know, buy-in is not the right word, but like the Russia's military wasn't deeply involved in planning a, a logistics fever and, dream invasion and ready for this. Yes, it was planned and it was kind of a fever dream based on his belief that Ukraine's not a real country. They're just Russians anyway and they're just going to welcome us like like we're liberators. Did not did not happen. Mm-hmm. Turns out when you bomb people doesn't endear them to you. Go go, go figure. figure. Yeah. Um but yeah, the, 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 he doesn't have like a way to signal credibility because he decided to go to war. If he says, "Oh no, like this is done now. Like, how would he signal that it's not going to happen again? So you need to have other powers involved. Would China say, like, no, and like, we're going to sanction them if they go back to war. So, like, now you can trust that it's not going to not going to happen. So, yeah, he 
has limited credibility. And there's theories about like negotiations and how like having a democracy actually is a really helpful signaling tool. If you have a House and a Senate who vote for what the president says about foreign policy, that shows there's buy-in among the whole political system that commitment is likely to be upheld. Right. Do you feel in any way that Ukraine, that Zelensky, that Ukraine, that his military advisors feel they need to push into Russia, take parts of Russia in order to, in order to go, okay, you give us this, we'll give you that? I don't think, I think it would, when Russia is occupying pieces of Ukraine, that's kind of an afterthought. Now, attacking in Russia to change perceptions in Russia or the situation on the battlefield is one thing. So these drone strikes against Moscow um, happening at night, they're not really intending, it seems like, to just kill civilians in mass and instill terror, but they are maybe hoping to demonstrate to Russia, we can touch you back, like we can make it hurt too. Mm -hmm. um, they're hoping to maybe make Russia move air defense assets away from Ukraine, just have more to defend, spread its forces out. Um, so like attacks in Russia against military important, militarily important targets, sure, but taking territory, like that's distraction from freeing Ukrainians who are living under occupation. And I mean, another thing we've learned, um, I guess we hadn't heard about what happened in like Bucha when we last talked, like torture center is basically every major town Ukraine liberates, like there is a desire to free these people from probably very oppressive mm -hmm. conditions, not least due to supply issues, but human rights abuses, outright murder. Um, and yeah, part of the reason Ukraine can't just like leave its people behind because it's already known yeah. what is probably happening to them. Right, right. It's interesting. It, you know, it's interesting because you think of how a war ends, especially a war like this, um, without a, a drive straight to the capital, uh, without nuclear weapons, hopefully, you know, um, and what Ukraine would be willing to tolerate, tolerate, uh, you know, will they be willing to like, okay, you can have Russia or you can have Crimea or now is, is, is their hair up? You know, are their hackles up? It's like, no, you don't get shit and not until you're completely so, out. So to use a technical term, pardon my French, but I was at a company before my, my current job that did a lot of polling, including in Ukraine. And the consistent theme we saw across the polling, some deviation like, hey, we could float. The most popular concession that's been floated to Ukrainians is maybe saying, hey, we're not going to join NATO after all. By the way, that has 18 percent support. That's the most the highest level of approval for a concession. When you ask Ukrainians, uh, we'd ask them about like free text, like just like say, like, what are you what are you thinking now? What's your thought on the war? And it's pain, it's tragedy, and it's fuck Russia. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, it's it's no, but that, that really is like the fundamental, like single unifying factor in Ukrainian politics right now. And it's it's I don't know if average Russians have truly grasped the extent like that this is going to be generational hatred. Yeah, um, I mean, it comes up again and again. Yeah, you look at like pre twenty fourteen Ukraine, and I'm not saying this to like dehumanize anyone or anything, but I mean, Ukraine had a reputation for being kind of a basket case state, and uh, the invasion of Russia, you know, it's the saying goes, you know, war makes states. Like the invasion of Russia unified these people, and you can see they want to make it work. So I mean, one of the things we we've seen during the war, talk about politics in Ukraine, politics in Russia too. The more we talk, the more it's like, oh, that's an important thing. That's an important thing we've seen. But yeah, in Ukraine. So people have said, oh, you, Ukraine wasn't a nation before. Right. The, and that's bullshit, overblown but, yeah. bullshit. But this I, Ukrainian nationalism was, if you think about a Ukrainian nationalist, it's a Western Ukrainian who speaks Ukrainian. There wasn't, I would say, a healthy civic nationalism. And you can see there's the pro-Western, pro-Eastern, pro-Western, pro, -Western, pro, -Western, pro -Western. Politics vacillated every election or so between these two camps. And it's kind of incredible to see like, the language politics were, were central in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Should we speak more Russian? Is that okay? Should we all learn Ukrainian? Um, how that's kind of become, I don't want to say a non-issue, but kind of a non-issue. You see videos early in the war with Ukrainians speaking Russian and Ukrainian firing a javelin at a Russian tank, blowing it to kingdom come and screaming together in two languages. That's totally well and good. We've seen the video of uh, 
Ukrainian special forces in a firefight talking in Russian with each other, not even to like prisoners of war, just with each other. That's like totally fine. And then, yeah, on the language note, uh, a lot of Ukrainians who grew up speaking Russian their whole life now refusing to utter a word of it. I met I met one at a, a wedding recently. It was I've actually been learning some Ukrainian too. It, like fascinating to like hear that shift. One of the other really interesting things is there's that views about the war, but from a fundamental uh, kind of identity perspective here, a que polling question about like whether you thought the fall of the Soviet Union was a good thing, asking that to Ukrainians. And from 2020 to 2023, 20% 20 more Ukrainians now think it was a good thing. Has nothing to do with anything that's happened in the war, but like, no, Soviet Union is Russia bad. So like, Really, Did, didn't they just uh, move away from some of the Soviet era iconography and adopt that the Ukrainian? Yeah, the statue in Kiev with the the shield and the the sword, Mother Ukraine. They removed the hammer and sickle and mm -hmm. added the mm -hmm. the the trident uh, instead. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I was thinking of all the uh, all the uh, private uh, con consulting groups that stood up, like the trident groups and whatnot, that aren't seals. They're actually like Ukrainian. Uh, military advisors and whatnot um but what, what do you think and we may have talked about this on the last show and i don't i don't recall but how do you think russia whether it's putin or somebody else russia will deal with this idea of nato being open to ukraine you know because there have been arguments for years like this isn't something that just popped up after the Russian invasion, but there have been arguments for years that NATO was pushing Russia towards war, right? It, it's, it's been a talking point. Um, now, whether that is, is factual, whether that played a part in Putin's decision, I don't know what's in Putin's head, but there have been those discussions. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you think that NATO it can be a calming effort in this? Do you think they're, they can be an incendiary, incendiary sort of if, it ever depends. It seems at present like maybe the most likely reasonable concession to be offered because Ukraine has proven it's able to, I mean, not maybe necessarily take back all its territory, but defend itself. If you had told someone at the outset of the war, Russian tanks are rolling in, hey, Ukraine is going to fight Russia to a stalemate, they'd be like, get out of here. Like, that's ridiculous. And that's what's happened. So hasn't needed an Article 5 guarantee of mutual assistance to defend itself effectively. So it's certainly possible. Now, the extent to which NATO was or wasn't a factor is, I mean, that's going to be debated for years. Sure. It's certainly talked about by Russian elites. We now have an interesting counterfactual with Finland joining NATO, yeah. which is also very close to Russia. And Russia removed forces from its border with Finland to send to Ukraine. And that's all well and good. So I... It's probably part of the equation I think, mm -hmm. to some extent, but I think one of my pet peeves with some of the arguments, so like Russia was provoked because of NATO expansion, but has never, that never really, it's never articulated. And then what NATO expanded and then like, what did Russia lose by that? Right. And it seems to be Russia's, the gripe is that losing the ability to freely invade <laughs> any country in its periphery, it so chooses, right? Right, right. Different fundamentally than um, the U.S. or NATO putting nuclear missiles in Turkey or Ru the Soviet Union putting missiles in Cuba. That's an offensive capability. That does change things. Sure. But if you look at you know NATO forces in Eastern Europe before, before Russia's latest invasion, um, not a whole lot there. What, are they going to conquer Russia with 10,000 troops and some strikers? Like, that's kind of hard to believe. Or I saw an argument, so, like, NATO was pumping Ukraine full of weapons before the war. Yeah, like, actually, incidentally, Trump was the one who started arming Ukraine more seriously than Obama had, sending um, Javelin missiles, which are useful, but like you're not going to take turf with that. That actually got approved on the very tail end of the Obama administration, okay. the Javelins. But, um, but I mean, yes, it continued through the, the Trump administration. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it seems like you know, Putin uh, uh, accidentally, you know, fought against his own cause and that he proved like, yeah, you join NATO, you don't get invaded. And, 
you have Finland and, and what is it, Sweden is on track. Yeah. So it's hard to imagine Ukraine wanting to give up that. I mean, this was a pretty great strategic blunder yeah, for Russia, yeah. I think, is the takeaway. They turned the Baltic Sea into a NATO lake, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, that's happened, um, have weakened their position in the world. They talk about, oh, BRICS and the global south, but Russia has become very highly dependent on China. We can talk about Russian politics and its economy. We can talk about Frigosia. And I mean, there's, there's the, yeah, a lot to cover. Uh, lot yeah, to before, cover. before we turn to that, I do want to talk about that. Um, before we, f we totally leave Ukraine, though, um, you mentioned Azov Battalion. And let, let's roll into that a little bit because that's one of the main arguments that the or counter arguments people make. Um, some of it is Russian propaganda. Some of it is Americans maybe who have legitimate concerns like, hey, these people are Nazis. Why are we supporting them? Are they neo-Nazis? You want to jump into Azov Battalion? Yeah. So, look, a lot of shades here. So like the origins of this battalion and group, Ukraine in 2014 desperately needed folks who were willing to fight and motivate it. And yes, these folks were neo-Nazis. That is not good. I, I knew people, uh, foreign fighters who joined up with Azov back in 2014. And yes, I can confirm as well <laughs> that there was a neo-Nazi presence in Azov battalion. That was no bullshit. They were brought then under military commands, rolled up into formal... Yeah like state control, governance, civilian control. And the last I've heard is that these views are um, they're still maybe they're less prominent than they used to or they used to be. Um, look, fundamentally, I, I have on one hand understanding, look, I don't want to make any sweeping generalizations, which of course means I'm about to, but there's been this trend of like, Eastern European countries pointing the finger like you're full of anti-Semites. You're right. full, and it's guys. It's Eastern Europe. I'm a, a Jew of Polish descent, by the way. So like, I, my folks know know this well. Like, there are there's anti-Semitism in well, not just Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and a lot a lot of places. Um, but the question is like, okay, like is is has Ukrainian state been co-opted by neo-Nazis? If you look at like percentage representation in parliament how much the far right has. Well, Ukrainian politics are kind of on ice now, but that wasn't a factor before the war. Less than in places like, you know, Finland and France and other countries, mind you. So that's one. You talk about uh, attitudes towards uh, sexual minorities, gay folks, uh, members of that community. Um, Jews in Ukraine weren't really getting harassed by these folks either. So that's kind of in defense of Ukraine. On the other hand, you've also had these kind of far right symbology mm. kind of laundered into the public. You see like soldiers who have mm. like death's head mm -hmm. and they're fighting for independence. It's not good. And I think it, it should be mentioned. That's like not a great thing. The flag of the Ukraine people's army, this uh, you'll see it common uh, red and black flag, which were Ukrainian nationalists fought for independence uh, before and after during World War II and sided with Nazi Germany for partially understandable. The grievance is understandable. Didn't like what Russia had done in Ukraine and, you know, potentially genocidal famine, but did side with the SS and Stepan Bandera killed a lot of Jews in Poland. So, like, not a good guy here. Reasonable grievance, but mm -hmm. not a great... So, like, you're seeing that symbology and I... And you're seeing, you know... it. Not, I'm not saying it's it's mass and throughout there, but you are seeing troops with bandera with a bandera patch, you know, yeah. with you know, and and you know, like it's it's there. It was written about in 2018. We stopped funding them because of of that. Um, it's important to contextualize though, because like it is a war. It is complicated. There are right. shades, and Ukraine. Not even by and large, almost entire. It's, it's a country fighting for its survival as a nation and state. The morals are with shades, and that's true in any war. But like the morals are pretty clear here, so I don't want that to be used or taken out of context to it will dilute. Be. Don't uh, worry yeah, about like, it. Sure. Don't worry but about it. it to will dilute be. to dilute the kind of morally just cause of Ukraine right. broadly. Right. Yeah. To color it as a as a some sort of neo Nazi force is like no, just not. Not sure. Drawing it w way out of proportion. 
And I, I maybe some people don't want to hear this, but I, I was told that, you know, when NATO started getting involved in Ukraine after 2014, now we're talking like 2015, 16, 17, that actually did start to professionalize Azov and start to push some of those more extremist elements yeah. out. It's what I've heard in the coverage, too, yeah. Um, okay, so jumping over to Russia, I think that there's a interesting conversation that comes up about this war potentially pushing Russia closer to cooperation, military or otherwise, with China. You brought up BRICS. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit, about the effects that this war is having uh, internally on China, and, and or I'm sorry, on Russia, and, and Russia's foreign policy in regards to some of its other neighbors. Yeah, I mean, a lot of places we could start. Um, if I could talk, kind of get back to my old stomping grounds, Russia's economy has been really interesting. Oh, the sanctions don't work. The sanctions are crushing Russia's economy. The ruble's stable. The ruble's devaluing. And I think what we're seeing is Russia muddling through, doing all right because the state is fundamentally... I mean, it's, think in rough comparison, if you're not an economist, to like what happened, what happened with like the U.S. in World War II. We're ramping up for a war effort created tremendous economic growth. It's also creating some tension inflation. There's a lot of young men who've been sent to the front. There's not enough, uh, not enough people to work. So that's leading to price increases, government spending, leading to price increases, inflation is not popular anywhere you go. But Russia's economy is doing fine for now. The question is, you have this rubber band that's been stretched and is no signs of breaking. I think that's one of these other like metaphors that applies where like Russia's defensive lines in southern Ukraine are have been unbreakable, but like a defensive line doesn't break until it does. It holds and then all at once, that's that's it. So Russia's economy is pulled back, it's doing fine, but what happens in the long term when you know, the war ostensibly eventually ends, hundreds of thousands of people come home, there's dislocation, there's price pressures, these are soldiers who are gonna have political demands eventually, the Decemberist rebellion in the Russian Empire was folks coming back from fighting against Napoleon. So that has dislo dislocative, is that even a word? Probably effects um, on Russian society. Um, the economy is now being essentially held up by state spending. What happens when there is no more war? What happens then? Part of the incentive for Putin to not make peace is that right now, like that is what is keeping his engine and one of his fundamental sources of legitimacy afloat is that government spending is is up. Um, what happens if Russia starts running out of money to spend? It probably have a couple more years, but like there are some much bigger questions. And I think the sanctions, if you're wondering, like, are they working? Demonstrated resolve. They've hurt Russia in the long term. It doesn't mean that that's going to be immediately visible. Mm. What else is there? I, Russia and China. Uh, has that changed the dynamics between those two countries? I mean, there's a, a whole history there that you can go back to the ideological split between them. But I mean, we can now focus. Stalin, yeah, yeah, we focus more on the contemporary aspects of it. Um, you know, these are two countries that have global aspirations. Um, has the war in Ukraine pushed them closer together and further away from the West? It certainly made Russia more dependent on China. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's for sure. Um, China has helped here and there to arm Russia, although it's also sending or selling weapons to Ukraine. You can see that continuing to happen. I think, and that is, I think, indicative that China has, I don't want to say played both sides, but I think is very content with whatever the outcome is. <laughs> if Russia merges strong and victorious, that's great. They have a, a partner in there. Fight with the U.S. may be too strong a word, but um, competition with the U.S., that's great. If Russia's weak, um, um, uh, the Russians have a term that would be like the a resource appendage, just like this extra little, what is it, like the angler fish where the male is just a tiny little thing that clips on. Like, that's what Russia will be for China, just like sends China oil but has no real power anymore. So those are both good outcomes. And by the way, China has uh, repeatedly, not just during this war, taken advantage in places or situations where it can set prices. Oh, like you need to sell us your gas where like, we're getting 50% discount. There's nothing you can do about it. So tough cookies. Um, so that's been a factor too. Now, Russia and China have a common enemy. It's not the right word, but like a common foe, common competitor. So that's brought them together. Traditionally, 
land powers that are next to each other don't get along. So like that ought to structurally push them apart. But I think right now their common interest has made them made them closer. Is it possible for Russia to fully pivot away from Western markets towards, you know, purely, you know, Eastern or Eurasian markets? Um, eventually, but there's nuance there. So there's Gulf money, which certainly is willing to play nice with Russia. These things take time, though. Like, you can't, right. like, snap and make supply chains turn on a dime. So, like, let's talk about hydrocarbons, for example, your oil and gas. Um, gas specifically. Um Russia's gas infrastructure pipelines were built in the Soviet Union to carry gas from Russia to Europe. And they can say all they want, we're going to sell gas to China. But again, China can dictate prices and you have to build pipelines and infrastructure to China. That takes years, even mm -hmm. if you're rushing it like that takes that takes time. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can pivot. It's possible, but not immediately. The other issue is that with Russia's currency situation and inflation, there's a technical term, capital control. So limitations on how Russian companies and individuals can move money in and out of Russia. Um, Russia wants to prop up their ruble, ruble rather. So they want companies and folks abroad to sell their foreign assets and purchase rubles to keep in Russia. Well, if you need to be flexible with supply chains and dealing with international players and all of your money is in Russia, that makes that harder. So there's competing interests here on short-term economic, keep the war effort, but like long-term economic, we need to invest. And that's been, you know, Russia's economy has been starved of investment for decades now. It hasn't really grown meaningfully since 2012. Um, I think real disposable income since 2020 has 2010 has grown like 5% in what, like 13 years? That's not, that's not good. Um, People are inflation, no matter where you are, that like makes people angry. It's true in the States too, true sure. in the West. And if this war does go on for another couple of years, I mean, what does that do to the Russian economy? Um, so again, as long as the state is continuing to spend, they should be able to stay afloat. But like the pressures, they grow and they grow and they grow. And this is one of these situations where people saying, oh, like Russia is going to fragment, Russia is going to remain like, I think my the, my prior here and like base assumption I think for folks watching should be that like Russia will muddle through it tends to do that but the pressures will grow. Look, Ukraine is in an existential fight. So while there's poverty and the economy has been largely wrecked, they have a really strong impetus to fight. And if Russia is fighting a war of aggression entirely outside of its own territory, like right that those contradictions, maybe not morally with the controlled media environments, but Certainly difficult in the in the economy start to get felt more and more and more. And that is one of the things that may push towards push towards a, a stalemate. Look, it's Germany's economy in World War One that like finally gave out. That was right. Right. That was what led to the end of the war. If you were, you know, this is an impossible question. So I'm just going to ask you to make wild ass guesses. But what what are the tertiary effects of this that we don't even see now um that that may be beneficial for us that may bite us in the ass you know what would what would a strong after years of building these pipelines what would a strong russia china you know uh, alliance look like if russia fragments what would that look like if there's a power vacuum like what are some of the pros and cons of, of the tertiary effects that could result from this. Okay, so if good for us, we're talking about like good for the United States and bad for us, like both. Like, and, and again, I know these are just guesses, but you know, yeah, being well, a student of history, I wouldn't count on Russia fragmenting. Okay, I, I, we can talk about that. Like, that is a like some of all fear situation. It's a nuclear armed country where folks who have the most guns are going to call the shots in various chunks of it. That's not good. We don't want that. Because we what, saw that with the Soviet Union. And but that was with with Bush one. That was like well managed. That was relatively relatively peaceful as far as empires collapsing uh -huh. goes. Like civil war. Yeah. Nazarbayev handed over the nukes and as did Ukraine. One mm -hmm. of the yeah. maybe historically maybe they're regretting that. Yeah, I'm, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, they to probably say, are. Yeah, to say that to say the least. Um, not a situation I think the U.S. should encourage. I mean, I I wish it would probably be helpful. One of the things I'd love to see from Biden to clearly state, like, what does the U.S. want out of this? It might be beneficial to say, like, 
we don't have pretenses towards Russia here. So you can't invade and try to destroy neighboring nations. Like that's really the line here. Like be Putin, like do your thing. But um, we didn't we didn't get a what would be nice to happen in 20 years of war and Afghanistan, Iraq, I doubt we're going to get it from any administration. Well, I think, you know, I mean, the thing is, no one in Russia is going to believe it anyway. That's true. I think it's good to part of the issue here now, whether or not NATO actually caused this. But there was this sort of footsie with Ukraine over the course of years, like a, there's a possibility. And I think it would have the West in hindsight would have been better served saying like, yes, this is happening. No, it's not happening. Here's our policy. And being just a little more upfront about that. And I think that's not a particularly controversial mm -hmm. thing to say. Um, as far as like knock on effects. So there's what this is we're starting to see very, very slowly, like the remilitarization Europe reemerge as a geopolitical mm -hmm. power. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. And it's going to take time, a because it takes time to restart supply chains to, to build one of these fundamental math problems we talked about, oh, should Ukraine get the F-16 or not? Like, no, can we build enough, produce enough artillery shells every month to like supply this, like the gears of, of war here? Um, Europe starting that process, starting to be like, like geopolitical again, hey, this European project can't just be purely idealistic. Like there must be military power and force, not used to conquer, but like that has to have that backing and you see this moment again it's slow um but germany like olaf schultz at political rallies like we can like resist russian aggression and he's kind of like as he's saying like, like wait like we can resist russian aggression like yeah like this realization he can be he can be like political in that way and talk about like national security interests and it's then gonna there's a real uh impetus. that's always fun when germany does yeah yeah there's a <laughs> there, there's a real impetus against talking like that in germany isn't yeah. there well Yes, and so this is, it's gonna take a while to, it's gonna take a while to change. It's, I've had very funny conversations with, with German friends who are like hesitant about rearming. It's this weird, like the, the Jew arguing, like Germany should be like a robust <laughs> geopolitical power. They've learned historical, and the German being like, no, we should not rearm. It's, uh, it's not Because it's there's, not there's such a, uh, kind of a irony to there, it. there's such a belief that they can't achieve their political aims through military force. And I don't think it has to do that, but like, I think it's safe to say had Ukraine been like a credible military actor, not Ukraine, sorry, had Europe been a credible European, had Europe been a credible military actor, what happened to Ukraine might not have happened because Europe would be able to. I mean, to when you say Europe is a credible military actor, I mean, are you talking about the formation of a European military? It doesn't have to be. There's so many, there's so many like political economy, complicated questions yeah, yeah. there. Who's doing what? I mean, we're seeing trends accelerate. You, uh, the Netherlands has focused, doesn't really need tanks anymore. It's kind of put its tank units into Germany's military. So we're seeing that this gradual ramp up. It's slow. What Germany was talking about at the beginning of the war, we're going to have the Zeit right. Wende, this political moment, change in eras we're going to spend on our military again. That's kind of gone slowly. I mean, one of these, the U.S. is going to have to decide about what we're going to do with with Europe that ultimately what will make Europe start actually taking security seriously is the US saying, okay, like, here's the date. Like we've we've done enough. We'll be here to help if anything happens, but like you gotta take the lead. And as long as the US is taking the lead, right, Europe right. doesn't have that incentive to to really gear up. And for the longest time I don't think we wanted them to. <laughs> no, but like <laughs> I think with some of the political difficulties we're having in the States, like there's increasing consensus that has to happen. As far as other kind of geopolitical trends, we, we talk about BRICS, um, de-dollarization, I think are certainly compared to the amount they're talk, talked about, very overblown. That's my my two cents. People may disagree. It may become something someday, someday but like BRICS as an organization, I think it was, was it Goldman Sachs? It was an economic designation. It was like a it was a investment report. Like here are the countries that are going to be growing fast as of 2010. But that's not like a political unit. The organization right. certainly is like in opposition to continued U.S. global hegemony. And, you know, for all the pluses and minuses of that. But it's never they've never come to a collective decision about something. Its two main powerhouses are China and India, who have like a border disagreement and like 
could go to war at some point. <laughs> um, Argentina's was just invited. Their two presidential candidates said like, absolutely not. We're not joining BRICS. So like, yeah, hard to see like what the they just had this like big summit. Sw- yeah. Sw- like, what did they have in common? What are they really? What are they really doing? And it's unclear, unclear like if they can actually like act as a cohesive. Oh, they're competing with the G7. Yeah, but like the G7 as a group like can create sanctions together and coordinate economic policy and COVID policy and financial regulation. Like that's there's something a lot more serious to that. Now that may change going forward, but um, yeah, the other dynamic is like the global South, Africa, South America being maybe cozier with Russia. And I think a lot of this stems from skepticism of US leadership. And people, it's almost funny when people see like uh, Lula in Brazil talk about, oh, we should make peace, like not being a fan of the, the US. He's a Latin American leftist. Like this is not, <laughs> not a particularly surprising. You know, of course they're skeptical of the US. Like that's, there's a lot of history there. So like, I don't think it's because they're attracted to Russia as a necessarily as like a geopolitical leader or see that Russia is a country that can offer them something in a way China can. But, you know, they're also smaller countries that have to balance their, you know, calibrate their foreign policy between these other great powers. Right. Yep. Um, one of the things in this project I mentioned where we're thinking about and, and looking at. But, um, yeah, I think a lot of it is maybe more about the U.S. than Russia per se. And it's mm. using the opportunity to agitate, shuffle, create change. How about the the subject of Putin himself? As a, you know, in America, I think we have this sort of I don't want to say infatuation, but certainly a fascination with dictators at times. And there's this continued fascination on the character and the personality of Vladimir Putin. If you, from your observations, have you seen any changes in him from the beginning of the war to where we are today? Over the course of the war, not particularly. Um, yeah, our, our, our boy Vova. Fun fact for, for audience, people say, look, he's Vlad. Vlad is not the short form of, uh, short form of Vladimir in Russian. It's Vova is the nickname. So, yeah, I sometimes refer to him by that nickname as uh, yeah, Vova, Vova here. Um, but I think the, the change started before the war, mm. where he kind of found religion. Like, his foreign policy and whole approach was, like, reputation was like very like nihilist before where like right whatever situationally can be advantageous but there's not really like a strong belief and seems to have kind of yet found this religion that russia as a great country the heir to this former empire and like this these lands are ours and eyes glaze over i mean he wrote this treatise in what summer 2021 about how like ukraine is not a real country well, well, the sidebar, we were talking about this a little bit before the show. I wanted to ask you about some of the things I had read that I think are controversial maybe about Russia, but that there's this sort of, um, some people would say a neo-fascist ideology in, in Russia about the Third Rome and this idea that the of the unique character of the Russian people as being the leaders of the Slavic people worldwide and that they're going to lead the world through their authenticity and, and all these kind of like ideas that as Americans – uh, seem very strange um, and maybe are kind of overhyped, you know, as, you know, we have this tendency to, like, see the entirety of Russian character through, you know, a couple literature figures. <laughs> um, but I'd like to hear your thoughts as a, as a Russian yeah, expert. I would strongly advise against, like, I don't want to say it's necessarily racial, but, like, that kind of, like, yes. the Russian, yeah, yeah, yeah. the inscrutable Russian mind. Like, how can we truly understand? Like, that... Like people have suggested, oh, Putin's not like a rational actor. What? Like, no, he has interests. Russia has interests. They're acting on their interests. Russia. My only editorial angle in my coverage of Russia over the years has been it's like a real country that like maps onto other things that like real countries with recognizable human beings with the same sort of yes, drives with, that anyone with, has. with unique characteristics and nuances as any other country would have. Um, but like Russia being a kind of this having this like messianic approach that has this clear purpose i mean like clear purpose manifest destiny uh, like oh actually that kind of maps on to some elements in u.s history too so it's not this like outlier per se i saw we were talking about this before recording in a piece of wapo coverage washington post uh, quote a quote about like the potential for 
continued Ukrainian military offensive. I said like, oh, like in the winter, like ground conditions may be tough. And also like Russians are like uniquely good at fighting in the winter. And it's just like, oh my God, you've got to be. The Russian people are the Arctic variant of human you, beings. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> like, no, like if they have cold weather gear, they'll do fine. And if they don't, they'll freeze like anybody else. Like, yeah. So I wouldn't lean too hard into that kind of that kind of, or you russia is uniquely able to take casualties but, but you think like, putin himself has uh, bought into this idea of sort of religious mysticism i don't know if it's necessarily like religious mysticism per se but like found, finding religion and like there's like a clear purpose for Russia. Like, <laughs> not me. all policy is fungible depending on the moment in time and mm -hmm. makes him a little more dangerous I right. think less harder to deal with because he has this Ideology fervor right. to his belief that Ukraine is part of Russia. That that argument that Ukraine's a made up country is is frustrating because every country is a made, made up, up country. Is, yes, yes. Every Nations people, are all are we, made we up. had the the what was it during not the uh, it was a couple presidential elections, a little conversation that the Palestinian people are an invented people. So offensive. And you hear that. It's like, well, we're all invented people. Yeah. I mean, the, the notion of Western, what is and Western? Frequently, and frequently when you have actors, Russia and with Palestinians and Israel in this case, acting under like the, the notion that people are made up, they tend to do things that <laughs> make nations. So like, yeah, go figure. Yeah. So uh, what uh, can Putin find acceptance on the world stage again, do you think? Um, that's a tough question. Like, we'll have to deal with, with Russia one way or another. It's, mm. I don't think it's going away for all the talk of decolonization and collapse. Like, I think it's going to be. Now, how much sticking power Putin has is a question. He will drop dead eventually, as we all will. Right. Like, that's, that's going to happen. Um, how old is he, 70? Yeah, they're, I think, older than that now. Um, getting on in years, and, like, he's been unable to figure out how to hand power away. I mean, one of the, the sources of, kind of, the war, how this bubbled up is his belief that, like, Ukraine was his final unanswered thing before he can step right. off the stage. But, right. like, will he be welcomed back? Um, I don't know in the same way. I mean, he's not able, even now, even among the global south, for, like, the BRICS summit, he couldn't appear in person. Right. Right? He... He's afraid of getting arrested. Sent Lavrov. Well, he had a recent speech where they had like someone dub over his remarks. It wasn't his voice. So like, well, it's interesting to see. Although it's a very different situation, uh, Assad being oh so slowly ingratiated back into the international community. It, well, I think there's degrees, and I think you know if and when this ends, like he will be dealt with. It's certainly because for like a durable peace, like he is party to it. He'll have need guarantees or guarantors potentially, but is going to have to be talked to in some capacity. And then what about Zelensky? Because, I mean, prior to the invasion, right, he had already sort of, he had already tried to infringe a bit on, on the media in Ukraine and then successfully did that once the war started. Um, banned unions, you know, uh, banned uh, pro-Russian politicians, you know, things like that. Um, and I know that in Ukraine, like they can't have, you know, under their constitution, there can't be an election while there's, you know, military law. To just note, like for historically speaking, for for countries in existential wars, this is not an outlier. So no, is, no, yeah. and I'm not like I'm not saying that that's in their constitution. Like that's not an issue. the The challenge I think is that there was a lot of talk about. You know, corruption. There was a lot. There were a lot of issues surrounding Ukraine prior to the invasion. Do you think that Zelensky will get away with more post invasion because people want to justify having sent? Do you think that he'll like jump in line? Because again, like I said, there were things he was working on against like freedom of the press and things like that, uh, even prior to the war. Now with with military law, like he's been able to pass that stuff, saying it, it's an existential threat you know, unions and, and things like that. Um, and it very much is, to, to wit. Like, I think that's safe, safe argument. But yeah, what happens in Ukrainian politics after the war is, is really interesting. Yeah. Um, I was talking to a Ukrainian professor uh, at a recent event on the sidelines. Um, the, the takeaway from that is really that, like, Ukrainian politics are, are largely on pause. And I think for understandable reasons. Sure, been sure, Consolidation. Absolutely around the war, but I mean, 
are there questions about how Zelensky prepared the country for war? Like, could he have mobilized earlier? Could he have moved forces? Should he have taken U.S. US warnings more seriously? Had a really interesting point there that part of the reason maybe is that Zelensky's formative experience as a politician was being jerked around by the U.S. The Trump administration is like uh, looking for not concessions, but like what Biden or X, Y, Z and was kind of skeptical of mm -hmm. the American political system. So mm -hmm. when when, you know, Burns or whoever it was said like, hey, like you're going to get attacked. Maybe thought there was an angle there, which is an interesting, interesting read on it. But um, there will be kind of a reckoning for that. And I think there will be political hay made. Um, Zelensky is certainly emerges kind of a national hero figure. The irony here is that he was not popular before the war. He, mm -hmm. His popularity was in the 20s, and there were corruption concerns. There are still corruption concerns. Right. Uh, one of the poll numbers I found today for some homework is that 77% of Ukrainians think that Zelensky is responsible for corruption, not in the sense that like he's done it himself, but that he, as president, owns that outcome. It's something that Zelensky has been sensitive to even during the war, so recently fired all of the regional heads of recruitment to, because of perception they were you know, not operating cleanly, cleaned house in the defense ministry. Um, Reznikov, uh, Ukraine's defense defense minister, um, was nearly fired, according to reports, because of corruption concerns and people ingratiating themselves. So that's still going to be a factor. Basically, Zelensky will have, depending on how the war ends, accumulated a ton of political capital for himself. And um, the question is how he's going to Right. Spend it. Now, some of the media questions, Ukraine still has a, a very, very vibrant free media scene. So the question is bouncing between, okay, we have this, I think, fairly liberal democracy, largely because it was a state that was too weak to, to be more authoritarian. Right, right. Um, how do we maintain freedoms while also like eliminating the influence of this oligarch class who has not exerted a good influence in the Ukrainian right. political system while like respecting property rights and interesting questions. Yeah. Very interesting. And I don't have a good answer. Yeah. For it yet. yeah. And it's interesting I, whether America or the Europeans, you know, the allied nations will take him to task. Like, okay, now, now this is done, clean up Ukraine, get rid of all, you know, handle these issues. Or if it'll be, we supported him, you know, these years and sent all this money. Let's not give anybody any reason to doubt what we did and just treat him with kid gloves. Well, if he wants to join NATO and the European Union, there are like some pretty specific things they'll have. Yeah, to do. and that's the European Union. A Europe should. That's something they can handle and and deal with. But look, I think it's not that people you know, say like oh, Ukraine is like fundamentally corrupt it's again like ukraine like russia is a real country too and like this has been an issue in post-soviet states with like weak central authority like this is not right. not out of the realm of right. the norm it's something that like it's not like something ukrainians are happy with either mind you like they're part of the issue why zelensky was unpopular before the war was a perception he wasn't cracking down on corruption enough i mean there were rumors about him being owned by kalamoyski and some of these oligarchs and you know don't can't say like the extent of the extent of that um but um there is going to be a social demand in a country that's going to be i think for this for a window after the war depending on how it ends right if there's a painful piece that may change things but uniquely uniquely united and i think more united than it's been in its entire history where there's now a common experience like every ukrainian who was born at the time will be able to answer like, where were you in February 2022? And that mm -hmm. hasn't been the case before. So, mm -hmm. like, there's going to be a common, a common purpose and the country will have an opportunity to basically be whatever it wants to be. And that, like, there'll be a lot of, a lot of political capital to make changes. So, yeah, look, it'll, be, it'll be interesting. Ukraine has been able to govern and manage itself shockingly effectively. Their train system runs better than Amtrak and it's being bombed regularly, so. yeah. Can we talk about Prigozhin? Yeah, I was just going to ask. Yes, let's please. get into it. Let's so get into it. Let's let's first start with the coup. How did we get, how did we get to that point? I mean, Prigozhin, of course, running the Wagner Group, uh, Russian mercenaries deployed into Ukraine, emptying out prisons and sending convicts up to the front lines. I mean, pick up wherever you'd like to pick up. Why why Prigozhin? Prigozhin 
uh, felt motivated to do this coup. What was going on? Well, with let's him talk about um, let's talk about Prigozhin, Putin's yeah. chef. Um, we'll talk about some some language. As I mentioned, I'm a language nerd. That I was trying to think of like the good punny title for this episode is like Prigozhin is now post Gozhin. <laughs> that's the that's the end of him. But yeah, so how did he like? Why was he around Putin's inner circle? So he was one of these very wily, clever folks who in the 90s was able to kind of get his hands into the, the state budget and was catering catering events for uh, Putin's inner circle, the, the chef. That was he's literally the, catering. That's not a uh, no, literally catering. That's not yes. like an, a, a mob. A euphemism. Him, no, like with, yeah. with, with food. Hey, go cater this guy. <laughs> with yeah. food. Um, now, the language fact here. So Prigozhin is language wise related to the Russian verb brigaditsa, which means to come in handy, to be useful. <laughs> now, the, the word gozhin god gaditsa is the same place that we get our word good from. So like this useful, it's a, it's a good, good thing to have around. And so um, his role in, in Russian foreign policy was kind of to be this offhand actor. Wagner Group can take casualties and do things that the Russian state doesn't want to be directly affiliated with. It. Syria. Yeah, like Syria, like um, the incidents trying to attack U.S. special forces and getting B-52. You know, the Russian you know, regulars didn't don't want, want none of that. No, of course, of course not. And apparently, have conducted themselves fairly professionally. They're not the ones, you know, going on murder sprees in in Syria, Ukraine. Maybe different different story. Um, but yeah, so he was used to to be useful. And so Bakhmut, um, he was able to actually achieve some degree of military success because um, he just tolerance for casualties. They're prisoners. There's Russia's worst who they were freed from prison and were able to... The tactics that I've read about were kind of interesting where they would basically just run at Ukrainian positions and the goal wasn't necessarily to take them, it was just to get folks alive close enough to call an artil artillery and then dislodge the Ukrainians and then attack again, human wave. Just, you need one or two people to survive. That's all you need just to say, here's where the Ukrainians are, attack them. I, it's, it's very morbid, Yeah, but it was working, it was working well. Now, so the issue politically with, with, this, with this fellow is that he was um, kind of a rival of Russia's defense ministry. He thought he was being more effective. Uh, Sergei Shoigu, Russia's defense minister, never actually was a military guy. He worked in Russia's, basically Russia's FEMA, but that does firefighting and emergency response too. Um, kind of became this rival figure and wanted more, more of a bigger piece of the pie. The other piece, sorry to mention, is his role in Africa, too, is like offhand foreign policy, being places where Russia doesn't have the resources or time to um, conduct foreign policy, like Mali, some of these coups we've seen providing support to these regimes after they take power. Um, interesting implications with Prigozhin out of the picture now, what's going to happen in Africa. But anyway, so what happened is, I guess, earlier, earlier this summer, um, Putin gave basically an order that all these private military companies, which, by the way, have been traditionally illegal in Russia, so, like, unclear how this was even operating. And yeah. the, there's a great quote, one of these, like, Russian nuggets uh, from the, I think, 1800s, that the, the strictness of Russian law is mitigated by the fact that it's optional. <laughs> um, so this is one of these, like, it was, like, not technically legal, but still there and doing work. So anyway... Putin gave this order down that all of the uh, these private military contractors were to be rolled up into the army. And that was kind of the end of the road for Prigozhin. They were going to take his forces away. He's done. Unclear what would happen with Africa and his kind of his fiefdom. So that changed, kind of fundamentally changed his logic where marching on Moscow is an insane <laughs> is an insane thing to do. It's like a... A hundred percent certainty of death, which, <laughs> right. as it were, seems to have led there. But right. if you're going to lose everything, and there's a one percent chance you might succeed by doing this thing, it's actually kind of a logical step to take. If the choice is you're going to lose everything or have a one percent chance of success, you go for the 
there's a whole like theory about like human decision making and risk taking where prospects theory humans right, are right. very very risk averse do you think he yeah. was legit marching on moscow to as a, for a coup or was he marching on moscow as a statement it's a great question and one i i think we'll hear about in a couple decades when those archives are potentially open part of like making peace with the fog of war difficult to know with that episode like i don't think he was trying to overthrow putin right he may have done damage to Putin's reputation anyway. It was more about overthrowing Russia's defense ministry, getting a bigger slice of the pie, piece of the action, maybe more forces, more commands, more influence. But, I mean, when he marched into Rostov on Don, which is the city in the south of Russia, he was, like, trying to capture the generals. Like, you guys, like, you're under arrest. I'm talking to you folks. So I don't think it was necessarily about Putin, more of like an appear, appeal to Putin. And... For whatever reason, he kind of chickened out before Moscow may have been told off, bought off, didn't want to avoid bloodshed. That part's a little unclear. Where, but where, where did he exist in the larger like Russian political consciousness? Because I just remember all these like pictures of like people taking selfies with him and all this kind of that stuff. That was one of the most, aside from the people who got killed on that hard day, Russia, they shot down a Russian like intelligence aircraft. They killed, I think it was like 13 people. Which yeah. Is, it was wild, but what a fun day on Twitter in the <laughs> Russia community where, I mean, normally it's a lot of takes. This is what's happening. That's what's happening. And everyone was just like, hell, I know what, what's going on. We're just going to take out the popcorn and see how this see how this plays out. And it was, it was, it was a bit of fun camaraderie in that. Um, but, so sorry, re restate the question? Well, I mean, where did Pergosian exist like yeah. within the Russian like social context? Right. Great question. So... Where he existed, and I think interesting in light of recent events and his his elimination is kind of became like a folk hero of more nationalist Russians. Oh, really? Yeah, and this is so... Putin has been more wary over the war in Ukraine, less concerned with the liberals against the war, and more concerned with the rah-rah nationalists. The ultra-nationalists. Hey, like, let's mobilize everybody. Like, World War II, yeah, yeah. let's do it again. There's a, a, there's a, there's a Russian phrase, Mojim Paftari, like, we can do it again. Um, yeah, it's, like, kind of bad. That was not a good episode in Russia's... So when Prigozhin did, like, his, like, selfie uh, video from the front Look lines, these, these are my dead boys, like, we, we, we need resources, like, all the ultra-nationalists were like, yeah, this is our dude. Yeah, yeah. But, but that's also Putin's fault for selling it as we are invading a Nazi country... Because those ultra nationalists, I mean, I'm sure that like they're tracing their lineage probably even further back. But a lot of it goes back to World War II, and a lot of it goes. But back the ultra nationalists, no, no, they can they can be alt right national socialists too. But they're, Nazis has a very fungible meaning in Russia, depending on the enemy of the enemy of the day. So there are Russian Nazis. Uh, I mean, it's fungible everywhere these days. That's so. true. Yes, yeah. um, fascist is like not even a helpful yeah. term anymore. But yeah, who are like Russia doing very Nazi like fascist things, but right. no, it's the Ukrainians in the West who are actually the fascists and not. It's, right. it's, it's a it's like a meaningless term. Right. And right. It's been warped by history. I did a great episode on my podcast again, Bear Market Brief, if you want to get really into the weeds on the Russia stuff, about like memory in Russia and World War II and this Yeah, I'll check it out. It's really uh, everybody check out Bear Market Brief and yeah. and in particular I, you probably don't remember the episode, but do you remember the title of it? Um, it was some wordplay, but the guest was Jade McGlynn, who's a great expert. She just wrote a book, actually, about memory in Russia. I think Memory Makers is the title. Um, so, yeah, worth checking out if you're interested in this kind of historical memory angle. Everybody is, check it out. You'll love it. Uh, World War II is a lot of meaning to, mm -hmm. to Russians. It's kind of a important, important time for... Yeah, so, I years. mean, it's... Look, the, I mean, it, it, when you look at the, their, their losses, both civilian and military... I, you know, it, it was immense. Like, they fought some major battles with virtually nothing. I mean, alongside Ukrainians, who, yeah, as a percentage wise, took even more casualties. And there you go. Then, yeah. So, uh, Prigozhin gets a little cooey over there. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, it's a little cooey. Uh, I mean, what, what, what was the outcome from that? So, yeah, we had this weird moment where uh, Belarus's president, Lukashenko, kind of came riding in on his white horse and was like, actually, in his we'll, lotta. We'll take him to Belarus. Unclear, like, what was the, did, like, he, was he instructed by Putin to mediate? 
I mean, Putin's big thing as, as a leader, just uh, as far as the defense ministry versus Prigozhin, he's kind of the referee. Everyone thinks that he's like making the decisions personally, but he tends to like mediate between factions as kind of his superpower. Um, so yeah, unclear where Lukashenko came from. Um, so yeah, uh, basically, uh, Prigozhin moved to moved to Belarus with some of his dudes who decided to go with him. Some were like rolled into the military after all. There's an interesting I think, dichotomy worth noting in Wagner. So you have a lot of these like prisoners, cannon fodder, but also like former like Spetsnaz, like very serious right. people who were like good, good at fighting. And the Ukrainians, there's reports like they learned very quickly when they were fighting against Wagner. Like these are real deal troops, not Mobik is like a Russian mobilized troop. These are the, the real deal professionals. Um, moved to Belarus, were evidently like stirring shit with Poland just to poke, hey, like we can cause problems, nothing too, too serious. And then, um, then yeah, kind of went quiet and then was flying over Moscow and seems to have been. And then Putin, I don't know if you caught this today, um, gave his like comments, like eulogy, kind of yeah. like a mob boss, like, oh, like, he did well for himself and for Russia when... He was a man of a complex fate. Yeah. <laughs> Something was, like that. This is very, yes, yes. Lojna Sudba is uh, com- weird. Yeah. <laughs> and the plane very clearly was not like a mechanical issue. Like they had like the flight radar, the altitude recording, like cruising, 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 cruising. <laughs> and it wasn't just like a descending. Yeah. So, uh, 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 is speculation, intelligence, early intelligence, is it pointing at Ukraine? Is it pointing at Putin? Is it pointing at Belarus? Uh, pointing at Putin. I think it's honestly the simplest explanation, which is kind of a crazy thing to say that, like, yeah, like, he crossed Putin. He made him look completely impotent. Like, pantsed him in a way that Putin has not looked weak. Right. Basically since the beginning of his administration. Um, opened a Pandora's box. Now, people said, like, oh, this is this is, like... Putin's going to collapse. I said it's the beginning of the end, but like that period of the end could take, you know, another 15 years. But right. it made it possible that there's a world in which Putin could be challenged and made to look weak. Similarly, in the example I give is when Trump like floated the possibility of the U.S. not defending NATO. Like he lost the election. There's a new administration. Even the military, you know, made it clear that that was you'd honor the treaty obligations. But like the fact that was uttered became possible, I think, like, that you can't put that back in the box now. Like, that is a, a possibility. So this is, he made Putin look weak, and you can't, you can't do that. I mean, the other thing that just, like, I mean, maybe this is, like, an asinine, I mean, tactical thing, but, I mean, the fact that, like, him and 10 of his, like, boys got into this little plane and flew to Moscow. Yeah, this it, Utkin fellow who founded Wagner. Is uh, in of itself a very... <laughs> Very odd thing. Well, this Utkin guy, this weird-looking bald dude, yeah, had yeah. SS tattoos. So, like, this, like, all oh, Ukrainian Nazi. There's, like, it's yeah. not a uniquely... There's plenty of Russian ones, too, including this high-ranking... But, yeah, like, it was a decapitation strike against, like, Russia's own warlord. is kind of wild. And there's a lot we don't know, and we have to make peace with that. Yeah, and I, I mean, from a, a, an American or Ukrainian perspective, I mean, when they start cannibalizing their own people, that's a, a pretty good thing. Napoleon's by never interrupt your enemy where he's making a mistake. Yeah, exactly. What do you think, uh, you know, we've seen on a little bit of action, at least with, like, the U.S. Embassy and the Lithuanians, the Poles, and everything with Belarus lately. Do you, do you see Belarus at all, like, ramping up, or do you think they're just going to kind of... Give give tacit support to Putin. Lukashenko is a very very interesting person. He, he, the traditional like question: Who who would you want to have like a drink with? Like I'd be fascinated to have a conversation. He's very clever. He's I mean managed to hold on to power for a long a long long time longer than Putin, mind you. Um, has really done everything possible to not get involved while looking like he's on the Russian side. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> Belarus is a belligerent in this war. Like, there has been combat action launched from Belarus, the invasion itself, but airstrikes, r- missile strikes. Like, Ukraine would have justification to invade and attack Belarus. Doesn't make sense. They're not going to. But he's a belligerent. There are Russian forces there. But he's, yeah, been very demonstrative um, uh, about... 
like, yeah, we're going to put Russian forces here, X, Y, Z, we'll take in Wagner, but, like, hasn't really done anything. Yeah. There's been reports, and hard to know, that, like, Belarus's military basically made it clear that, like, we're not getting involved. They'd be, they're, they've been poorly funded, poorly trained, they'd get torn to bits by trains motivated Ukrainians. Hey, speaking of World War II casualties, Belarus is actually not allowed to use its military constitutionally outside of the country. Really? They suffered the highest casualties as a country really? uh, during World War II. Interesting. Yeah, devastated. I think I think um, the movie Come and See, which is one of the most fucked up movies. I haven't seen it. It's, what, it's, what's it's, it? Come and See, Disma Tri, is about Belar Belarus in World War II. It is, if you want to ruin your day <laughs> and like have a lot like a drink like oh my god yeah that's a yeah powerful world war ii movie oh yeah yikes yeah it's fascinating so so when you say there are belligerent and missile strikes is has it been them has it been the russians have they just it's been... russians using belarus as a launch pad but that's kind of right a right yeah same same yeah. difference it's... yeah yeah i just didn't know if, if you know belarus is kind of like or if they were like oh well, you guys you guys yeah, defend the border, but Ukraine, we're not going to pay attention to what Ukraine you're doing. has lobbed some missiles into Belarus, but like at Russian facilities. Before. Right. So like that's, and then like Belarus, Lukashenko just, I guess it was yesterday, like congratulated Ukraine with, like congratulated. Sorry, I'm thinking in, in in Russian, congratulated on Independence Day. Hey, like Belarus and Ukraine are are close peoples, and we <laughs> like it's just this. Yeah. And they troll each other over the border. They have like radio broadcasts. They put like signs up. Hey, you're under a dictatorship. Hey, you're under not like, but they don't shoot at each other. Yeah. I feel like if Putin falls tomorrow, Russia's in chaos. Lukashenko will be like, I was the only one <laughs> keeping this from like really blowing up. Like it was all me. Yeah. Um, really interesting dude. And also a brutal dictator who has done grievous harm to many Belarusians. I don't just want to... Yeah. Belarusians, rather. Yeah. So, uh, before we get into questions for Aaron, I guess, like, the last question I would have is, at this stage in the conflict, do you see any limitations of American power, uh, limitations of American military assistance? Are we running up against a wall? Um... I think there's still more political will to send goods. There's still more uh, Cold War stockpile we could mm -hmm. unleash. There's still more current stockpile we could unleash that just there's been pretty clear political signal that's not going to happen. Um, there's supply, there's again, supply chain, there's the math, the fundamental, the, the gears of war here. Like, actually, we can't make enough artillery rounds to supply Ukraine. We have to ramp that up. There was a story. Um, I think about a month or so ago that like Raytheon had to invite a bunch of like 60, 60, 70 somethings to like restart their Stinger missile line because it had been dormant so long and we're just kind of out of them. So we're going to need to build more and then needed to optimize, start building those again. Like that's a that's a factor at play. So there's some parts that just have to be like ramped up again. Um, as far as goods supplied, there's been talk of what Abrams tanks eventually the um, the export model I think has been the kind of the older older variants. The F sixteen has been kind of kicked around a while. There are pilots that are going to be pilots that are going to be trained, but like what that'll come online in maybe next year, and mm -hmm. I don't think we'll play a huge difference in the war. So we've enabled Ukraine to keep fighting, but I don't think have provided any like one off game changer Wunderwaffe, you know, weapons that would <laughs> like like single handedly everyone talks about like precision cruise missiles XYZ and the um the ground launched small diameter bomb XYZ, but it's really like artillery shells and APCs that are like the main bullets and mass that you know allows Ukraine to keep fighting. Do you think that the the numbers in this conflict are now ticking down towards some sort of negotiated settlement? Like we're moving towards an end game? I think what well, war just inherently like is going to lead to some negotiated settlement. I don't see it happening. There's nothing, I guess would say, nothing that suggests to me that this is going to happen anytime soon. Mm -hmm. But I think it will, wars end in negotiated settlements, whether it's the complete capitulation or otherwise. And I don't think it's going to be, a, don't think there's going to be a desk and a yeah, paper yeah. in Kiev or Moscow, but there will be some agreement sometime or an armistice, like Korea style. Right. Like, Right. Where we're like, the war is on pause and that will just be okay because it has to be. 
with you know you you mentioned that you know we're we're emptying that we're giving ukraine our stockpile and we've talked about this on the show before with like andy milburn and maybe some other people uh, about this idea that that the u.s isn't in this as much to help ukraine as it is to bleed russia and you know when you look at some of our arms deals with other countries like f-16s to jordan you know uh you know weapons to saudi arabia the gulf states you know turkey you know the, these other countries that maybe we have that aren't even actively in, involved in an engagement um where here we're sending you know a billion two billion uh, uh, worth of or uh, i mean 100 billion 200 billion worth of weapons and cash do you do you, do you think that uh i'll just ask what's your opinion on the idea of slow rolling are we giving the Ukrainians the weapons they need to actually win the war in a timely fashion, or are they, are are yeah, are we just slow rolling it? I so I would say that I don't believe that harming Russia is like the principal guiding factor here. Yeah, we're getting a very good return on investment for for providing weapons. I mean, that's like it's an externality. I think of the core reason of of the policy. Um, yeah, there's a lot of opinions on this. Um, I think certainly Ukraine, Ukraine's military would say, like, we haven't been given, especially for the counteroffensive. They're trying to take on a very, very tough military challenge with no air superiority. Mm -hmm. Like, that's, that's hard. I think they'd be very grateful to have a lot of F-16s. Yeah, I mean, to, military commanders are always going to want more resources, for, even, yeah. even, even ours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think Biden and the administration broadly have... Slow rolling is 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 maybe not the word I use, but would would have tried to like manage escalation and you know they've talked about like attackums and like long range missiles to to gradually ratchet up to demonstrate continued resolve, but not in a way that would lead to like a fundamental break in like Russia to completely collapse, which could become dangerous for Russian escalation. Now, Russia has also demonstrated its uh, the credibility of its deterrent is not very serious. So like if the U.S. gives tanks, it's nuclear war. U.S. gives tanks, nothing. If Ukraine attacks Russian territory, it's war, or nuclear war, and Ukraine does that, nothing. So certainly hasn't done itself any favors there. But I think, yeah, there's, Biden has tried to, like, put limits on what these weapons can be used for realistically um, and yet signal some degree of moderation to leave, maybe leave open the possibility of, of, of talks, that, you know, without completely showing that there's that this is a fight to the bloody finish and there's no way this could be negotiated. Well, we talked about, uh, like, the we on one of the past shows, we talked about, like, the Biden administration blocking Wallace's, uh, you know, bid for U or for, uh, for NATO, or UN, was it UN or NATO, um, over the F-16. I think it was maybe NATO? I think it was NATO. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Yes, pretty sure NATO right secretary. Now. Yes, NATO secretary general. When he's like well loved, you know, and everything else like that. Over, just want I think wanting to train, you, you know, uh, Ukrainians and F-16s. It, it, uh, do you have any insight in that, like where that might come from, or what what that was about? That gets a little more into some of the military politics that okay. I really focus on okay. day in and day out. Um, but yeah, I think the, the, the hope here. I think that we can talk about like what the U.S. wants out of this, and I think maybe the main motivation is this is kind of the the we use the term like order defining, uh -huh. where Russia is basically proposition that it is okay on the global. I mean, I mean, they wouldn't say this broadly, but demonstrating in Ukraine it is okay to invade countries and conquer territory, uh -huh. which is very very problematic if you're the leading global power. I mean. U.S. Is, has an eye on Taiwan as it's watching what happens in Ukraine. Hey, if we don't demonstrate the credibility of defense commitments in our interests, Taiwan is next. And that's not good. China's scarier than, than Russia is. So. Right, right, right. Yeah. Do uh, we have questions for Aaron? Uh, we? we do, and we have some on Patreon. Let me get the ones on YouTube real quick. If I could have on my hobby horse for a second here, one of the things yes, we, we talked about, the arguments that the U.S. isn't spending money domestically because it's funding Ukraine. I just want to, like, 
whack that with a hammer, that the reason that we can continue to fund Ukraine is because there's maybe frayed a little bit, but there's a political consensus uh, in the states that that's a doable thing. And there isn't about other domestic spending. If there was a consensus about dom domestic spending, we could do that, too. So it's not because there's no money left because we gave it all to Ukrainians. We, just, we, like, we talked about that on our, our Patreon, spe you know, our, our Patreon viewer special that. Yeah, we're giving a lot of money to Ukraine, but the idea that we're taking that away from people in Hawaii or, 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 or you know, people in, you know, who live below, you know, the poverty level, or whatever, like our government wasn't doing that anyway. Right. Um, you know, and, and they could give, they could help out Hawaii, they could help out, you know. There's a coherent isolationist worldview that would say we shouldn't support Ukraine, but like, the, the 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 number part of it the like fiscal policy that's not that's not the reason you can make that argument without saying oh because we need the money for right. domestic reasons now the fiscal policy is interesting because i think right now most people who are in support of supporting who support ukraine or support our efforts you know in ukraine say yes keep sending the money it'll be interesting to see if this goes on another 5 years another 10 years you know uh, uh, what if that's if that changes because we're blissfully like we are blissfully removed from the horrors of what's going yeah. on so all it, all it is to us is a is a budgetary number right and a drop in the bucket at that for budgetary right. numbers but but we're we're blissfully removed from the actual toll that this war is taking on the Ukrainians and, and the Russian, you know, the Russians who are being pushed in this war, too. I mean, obviously they could. Another hobby horse item that, like, we're making the Ukrainians fight when they don't want yeah. to. Like, yeah, crazy. I don't, As a I don't proxy think thing is like, yeah. yeah. Well, so I think people say, like, the war is like, oh, it's because of the counteroffensive. Like, the war is getting less popular. There was the recent poll, like, 55 percent of Americans say enough. And I think that's... Uh, uh, probably getting way over our skis to suggest that like most Americans are following the ebb and flow of the war sure. very closely. I think it's more about inflation and the economy and the amounts to which the war is in the news. And the trend I've tended to see when we had the Kharkiv counteroffensive and Ukraine made this smash and grab amazing offensive, America, you know, started noticing Ukraine was in the news. They did something good. Oh, yeah, like rah, rah, Ukraine. Like, let's give them more money. And then. Right. There's been kind of added the news, the kind of same like mm -hmm. malaise with the economy here. There's still inflation that's bad. Oh, Ukraine, what's even going on? Right. And if Ukraine breaks through again, they'll be like, oh, wait, like, way to go, Ukraine. Rah, rah. So, right. like, right. Um, so, Doc Point, thank you very much. Uh, did experts correctly assess you know, the improvements Ukraine made to its defense capabilities since 2014? What did they get right and wrong about the beginning? So, I think the entire field, most of the entire field, there's a couple of people. When I would shout out um, Mike Kaufman, who does a lot mm -hmm. of podcasting on War on the Rocks, is like him and Rob Lee, who does work with FPRI too, are like the preeminent. If you want tactical updates and like real nitty gritty military in a way I am be above my pay grade, um, great, great follows. Um, so, yeah, um, what changed since 2014 about Ukraine's military? So, we've seen the adoption of Western-style dele delegated warfare, like the emergence of a strong NCO Corps, um, we've seen that kind of take hold in the military. We saw that particularly in the chaos of the first days of the war, where there were there was kind of just chaos going on. In, these, in so many cases, just civilians picking up guns and fighting. I and mean, these, the, the initiative is amazing. But smaller units able to do that. And I think one of the things that we're now butting into with the counteroffensive, and I've heard, and again on podcasts like in War on the Rocks from, from Mike and Rob, that smaller units um, have been able to adopt this, but like division level coordinated, when you have like generals involved, they tend to be of a more Soviet mindset. And, um, and that's, that's complicated things. They are very, you know, like objective, you go here and then you go here and casualties be darned. We're gonna do what we have to do there. Um, I think the Ukrainians have demonstrated a lot of ingenuity adopting new hardware and technology. They have this real like patchwork of different military Equipment, tanks, and vehicles. They've uh, strapped like what, like JDAMs to uh, like Suhoi aircraft. Like they're not built to attach to each other. They've figured figured that out. Um, so they have a lot of technical ingenuity, which is not surprising. I mean, pursuing like drone warfare—that's been crazy to see. Sinking 
there's a great article in The Economist magazine about how the Moscow was sunk and Ukraine, Ukraine had, they built uh, a lot of missile rocket motors uh, for Russia before things. Yeah, back to the Soviet Union, they were like their main supplier of ballistic missiles, I believe. I wouldn't be surprised if in, you know, the war drags on, like Ukraine will build nuclear or otherwise, but will build ballistic missile capabilities because they can. Right. They, they have the know-how right. on hand. Right. Um, yeah, as a deterrent. Do you see them at all attempting to restart the nuclear pro pro program? Um, it's interesting. So the politics would potentially favor it. It would be a way to extract concessions from that the they, West. That they have nuclear power plants indicates that they have the capability to produce. So they have the, the technical know-how. If they right. want to. As far as like to do that stealthily, like, like break out and the, the, what is mechanically required to do, I would there's defer. A lot, there's a lot that goes in. I would that. refer to experts. But as far as the politics, yeah, you could say like Russia, this is our, our, our final line of defense to ensure the existence of our state. Hey, West, like we would hate to do this. So why don't you keep sending us stuff and we'll agree that we're, we're not going to build a new. But like the politics. The politics are, are there. I because, mean, one of the one of the agreements we made with them when they denuclearize the sorry, Budapest memorandum that yeah. we defend them with that we would defend them. Territorial yeah. integrity. Yeah. Territorial integrity. Denuclearize. Yeah. A couple of glasses. The whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and dog point. Thanks again. Uh, did you work with other tier one units or FBI HRT? What did you think of them? What? Just kidding. <laughs> Grats on the hundred K uh, team house. <laughs> thanks dog point. I appreciate it, man. Um, and then um, Osir Roberto, uh, how would you adjust sanctions? Go after transshipment countries like Kyrgyzstan? Yeah, so it's a great, great question. It's something in my my job now that we the transshipments. It's a gr figuring out how we still see U.S. Um, dual use and chips winding up in Russian military components. So adjusting sanctions, there's kind of a theory with sanctions. They're either getting stronger or getting weaker. You can't have consistent sanctions because people start finding loopholes now. It's much easier to adjust sanctions than to find new loopholes. The sanction, what? OFAC is the Office of Foreign Asset Control at Treasury. They just write a sentence on a piece of paper that's implemented. But to, to build a supply chain to get around sanctions takes time and money. Uh -huh. But yeah, there there's certain trans transshipments issues. It's enforcement um, of existing sanctions. There are certain limitations like... Sanctions against Kyrgyzstan would land a lot better than sanctions against Turkey because we need Turkey as a as a NATO ally. There's like there's a much, and they could be realistically honest broker for like peace deal. So there may be limitations there. And the part with sanctions about Russia, as, as far as Russia goes, is that like this is a delayed fuse damage. Like Russia is basically mortgaging its future right now, and like the 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 impact of sanctions will be felt a lot more going forward. Is deferred investment that like, really starts to bite. So we may see the true impact of sanctions later. To say they haven't worked against Russia is wrong. They haven't stopped the war, certainly not by by any means, uh, but they have they have done damage and made it harder for Russia to, to operate. And then a couple questions from Patreon. How do you assess the state of European support for Ukraine? If US support wavers as the 24 election cycle approaches, can Europe provide enough of a backstop to avoid a stalemate? Yeah, so it will take time. Europe is kind of remilitarizing, ramping up production. I've seen certainly European political will do okay. There's Orban in Hungary is kind of the the uh, the I'll counter offer. example yeah. there um, for his own political reasons. Turkey came around after the election because it was really seems like it was mostly domestic politics and this long-term geopolitical agenda but now it's it's fine but yeah this this schultz moment of like yes we actually can hey we can resist russia um look there's the kind of ever-present threat of populism in russia like le pen in france um i still think my view and this may be proven wrong um it's more about inflation in the economy than russia per se um i don't think anybody among european populists or even in the even the United States like gets points for being pro Russia anymore because it now means something it didn't used to mean. You know, for Trump or Le Pen to be like, oh, like we can do business with Russia, or um, who's the the new in the Republican debate? Uh, Vivek. The, yeah. I don't want to pronounce his last name wrong. I uh, certainly will. But um, 
he was talking about like him doing business with Russia. I don't think if he became president would actually come to any meaningful agreement, but I think it's a, it's differentiation versus... Yeah, in, versus, in, in, in a debate, you get to say all kinds of stupid stuff, like we're going to bomb Mexico. <laughs> you, you would never, never do if you were actually elected. But I think it's more about inflation and domestic political factors than it is actually about Russia or Ukraine, per se. Yeah. Now, in, you, in, in Europe, what's happening, like the decoupling from Russia has a much greater political and economic impact than it does in the States because Europe and Russia are much more tightly integrated. One of the things we saw between last time I spoke with you and, and now is that Europe got really lucky because it was an extremely warm winter last year and it spared the worst mm -hmm. of Russia right. turning off the gas bigot. Yeah. Right. Well, not just them turning it off, but Nord Stream 2. Like, uh, Getting like, blown up. Yeah. Another mystery along yeah. the way. Yeah. Um, Isaac, uh, thanks. Uh, how do you think Chinese PMCs are reacting to everything Wagner re related in addition to the assassination? Or does the PRC even have their Wagner? I'm less familiar. I'm not a China specialist, so I don't want to get out of my lane here. As far as I understand, Chinese PMCs have been largely around like resource plays in Africa, yeah. as best I understand. I think it's different pol politics yeah. around that. Yeah. Yeah. There, There is, I mean, my opinion, I think there's going to be a certain amount of like um, social learning or military learning that like they see what's possible. Um, you know, did Russia see what was possible with private military uh, companies Blackwater. from what we did in Iraq? I mean, the Chinese tried to bring Eric Prince into the fold, I mean, literally at, at one point. So, so it's not the end of PMCs right. in Russia, mind you. So there's Gazprom, Gazprom, as we would say Oil in company. English, um, has has like an affiliated, fakil is uh, like a like a torch is, I guess, the you say that in English, um, like a PMC. And I mean, these local military formations and private military companies, it's a way of distributing rents, so like these excess economic profits, keeping the system in line. So like that need is still there for Russia, just that Wagner got like a little out over its skis by right. marching on Moscow. Yeah, right. like, don't, do it. don't do that. Yeah. Um, and then who were the uh, people on the plane? Who are the other people on the plane? Were they just collateral damage? If so, this is the Kremlin killing their own citizens so they can raise the tensions among the Russian people against not, their government? Not to raise tensions among people. Yeah, there was collateral damage. But, you know, what the casualty report is that 140,000 Russians have died in this war. So, like, what's another four? So it was the, the key... The key players, so was um, it was Prigozhin and then Utkin uh, were the two primary leaders of, of Wagner who were who were offed. Um, they're the ones who were yeah, and then flight attendants, which is you know sad. Yeah, for, for another them. unfortunate aviation mishap. Yeah, yeah, and so it has Wagner Group com been completely like uh, absorbed by the military at this so, time? They're apparently leaving Belarus, last I read. I think we'll see kind of what happens. But I think that's likely the, the outcome. And uh, that's it for questions. All right. I mean, any uh, final thoughts as we wrap up here about... We covered a lot of ground today. Yeah, we did. <laughs> that, was, that was a lot, a lot to bring back up to speed. I would just float. It was really sexy at the beginning of the war to donate to Ukraine to hang flags and... There's a lot of humanitarian need still. I mean, especially the destruction of the no Novaya Kachovka Dam, like the, the huge ecological catastrophe. It's not talked about anymore. Um, Razum for Ukraine, R-A-Z-O-M. If you feel generous, want to chuck them a buck, I uh, would still recommend it. It's still very, very much needed. Yeah, send them a buck, folks. I mean, humanitarian aid is always cool. And where uh, you mentioned that you do this podcast, you work with this think tank. I mean, where can people find you and find your work? Yeah. So if you look up at Twitter at the uh, the handle at Bear Market Brief, Bear, um, you can find it there. Um, B A R E or B E A R? B E A R, like Russia. Yeah. Like, but also Bear Market. It was a yeah. plan words at the at the time. I thought it was a naked market. <laughs> you can find it. So you can find it there. If you look up Chain Reaction podcast. Um, anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can find stuff there. So I do a couple. I do Bear Market Brief, which is about um, yeah, Russian, Eurasian, Ukrainian politics. I do another series called The Continent, where each episode I visit 
quote unquote, I wish I could visit in person, but I visit a country in Europe as a non-expert to learn about, hey, war in Ukraine, how's it impacted Germany, Poland? I did a um, Serbia, Kosovo one recently. So we're, I'm going to do one in September about Moldova. So like learning cool. on the ground about what's actually happening as a non-expert, so very accessible. So another way you can learn with me. It's been kind of fun to do. Anywhere else? Uh, yeah, that's, I think... Oh, yeah, so as far as countries... Um, or, or, I mean, places where people can find your work or... And then on Twitter, though, I try to stay off of it as much as I can. Sorry, on X. Um, I've seen your dad jokes on there. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of dumb wordplay, sometimes analysis, but I think <laughs> the podcast is really where I do most of, most of the work. And then on Twitter, some remarks as we have interesting weeks like this one. Now, I guess the kind of final fun Russia subject matter fact is that August is traditionally an inauspicious month for Russia. And there's a few days left of August, so we'll see, uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Well, hopefully uh, we'll have you in here next year, but we will be discussing how the war ended. Uh, you know, let's hope for the people involved. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, next Friday, we will be back with Chris Whitcomb. Uh, Chris served on the FBI hostage rescue team, and uh, we'll have him here in studio. So we're really excited to talk to him. Um, Aaron, thanks for coming by tonight. Good to be back. Man. Thanks, Appreciate brother. it. Yep. Yeah, we'll do it again, you know, sometime, you know, yeah, like Dave said, maybe in, in next year, have you back for another update. And we really appreciate having, you know, your expertise on the show. Great to be back. All right, guys. So uh, we will see you next Friday. Take care out there. Oh, and thanks.